So um, I really, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a combination. <laughs> yeah. <They> continue. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so I've been here um, um, for a year and a half, just me and my family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you been writing writing lately? Or? Well, uh, I had a lot of, I've, I've been teaching, so I was very busy. Mm -hmm. But I actually have finished a book, just finishing the editing of it now. A book coming out in October. Mm -hmm. oh, that's gone. Oh, <laughs> keeps changing on the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're doing this book, which is called Aurochs and Orcs, mm -hmm. and it's a book about extinction. Mm -hmm. Not poetry, it's a, it's a it's very short essays. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I think uh, I'll have to, it's one one, so maybe it's better to start uh, uh, formally. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. So I think there's a lot of people who will be joining in uh, from around the world. Uh, so, but uh, I mean, there might be a few disturbances if it's not mute. So uh, let's see, I'll, I'll try to deal with it. It's quite this, uh, yeah, it's quite technical over here. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Welcome everyone, and uh, I would like to invite Joan Burnside uh, in this author, live author talk. Uh, and uh, if you could put your all your mics and the video mute, that would be really helpful. And uh, uh, this program is sponsored by the Scottish Book Trust. Uh, Joan Burnside is is a big name in poetry world, as well as he's a wonderful writer. Uh, his novels include The Devil's Footprints, 2007, Glister, 2008, and The Summer of Drowning, 2011. He is also the author of two collections of short stories, three memoirs, and several prize-winning poetry collections, including Black Cat Bone, winner of the Ford and the T.S. Eliot Prizes in 2012. His most recent collection of poetry is Learning to Sleep, which will appear in August 2021. He lives in rural Scotland with his wife and two sons. Uh, welcome everyone once again. And uh, there might be a few technical, you know, like nitty gritties here and there, but please don't get distracted with that. I'll just try to sort it as much as possible. And uh, because uh, a, lot of, a lot of viewers want to hear you, and uh, uh, can you tell me something about your childhood? Uh, where did you grow up and how was your childhood? Yeah, um, well, actually, I, I, I grew up. I think there's something, a uh, problem with the. Uh, 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 Jones uh, audio, I think this. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now it's okay. Now it's okay. Yeah, it said I was muted. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. Little, uh, yeah. I was suddenly muted. Yeah. Um, I I actually grew up about thirty miles from here, where I live now. In fact, although I've been lots of other places in between, mm -hmm. uh, I was born and um and raised to begin with in a, in a pit town, coal town in West Fife, and I guess you could say we were very poor. Um. We, we lived originally in a tenement building with, uh, you know, rats and stuff. It was, we moved when I was three uh, to a, a prefab. And we were, we were kind of the prefab kids. And uh, there was a kind of farm road at the edge of town in Cowden Beath. And on one side of the farm road was the proper houses and where, where the regular folk lived. And on the other side of that farm road, there was just the prefab, they called the prefabs. And there were actually buildings that prefabricated buildings that had been built for uh, during wartime, in fact, and were scheduled for uh, demolition. But 
uh, ended up being places where people stayed for quite a long time because there was no other housing that was cheap enough for them. So we were, we were pretty, we were raised pretty badly off. We didn't have anything uh, material. Um, and then when, when, then when I was 10, 11 years old, um, we moved suddenly to England uh, where uh, my father got a job working in the steel mill there. And then we had a little bit more money. So that seemed to be, everyone thought we would be much happier, you know, I guess, if we had more money. But of course, that, that, as often is the case, material benefits don't actually make you happier. So we had quite a miserable time during that time. And I'm afraid I was quite a, an, an, un, an unhappy and rather annoying teenager, mm -hmm. um, you know, so and my, and my only real escape from that kind of feeling of alienation from where I live was, to, was books, actually. Mm -hmm. Books and um, to some extent sport, but mostly books. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's, I mean, uh... It's quite nostalgic to hear about uh, your childhood. Isn't it? Uh, what influenced you to write, Joan? Like, when did you first think that you'd become a poet uh, or a writer? Like, what what is or what were the books that influenced you? You know, like. Well, in my first house, we had no books at all. We had no. We literally didn't own any books. Not not one. Um, um, and then when we moved to England. Uh, we, I found the local library, and I, I always argue how important libraries are. Um, this is a working class town, it was, you know, a steel mill town, and often people assume that the kind of library you give to people like that is like full of westerns for the men to read and romance novels for the women to read, but there was obviously a very enlightened librarian there who bought for the, for the library all the great classics and lots of history books and so I found this library and in fact, I had to get special permission to get an adult reading ticket, you know, the card, um, because I was actually 12 or 13 or so. Um, and uh, this library was like a kind of mine of wonderful things. It didn't have a lot of poetry and it had some, but it had all of the Russian, many of the Russian classics, French classic novels, um, Dickens, uh, Mrs. Gaskell, um, you know, all of the classic novels, and, and I especially got attached to the 18th and 19th century novel. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I read, I read more prose then. And in fact, in school, um, it was quite odd. I, I, I kind of rebelled against the, the kind of poetry that was given to read in school. I was a Scottish Catholic child who was very poor. And um, they were giving us things to read like Rupert Brooke and, um, you know, if I should die, think of me this of me, that there's some corner of foreign field, this is forever England. And I was saying, but I'm not English and you know, I'm not part of that social class. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the poetry we read, for me at that time, I associated with the social class that was kind of above us and kind of controlled our lives. Mm -hmm. And I actually found poetry through American poetry. Mm -hmm. And I remember my very, my first impulse to write a poem was after Rujat by Marianne Moore, wow. which I did find in the library. And I thought, I basically thought, oh, you can do this? You know, this can be done. And so I, um, I, 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 I wanted to write poetry then, but I didn't start writing until much later. You know, when I, when I first came to Scotland as a student, I was very much influenced mm -hmm. by one of your poems. It's called "The Good Never," and uh, oh, yeah. uh, during those university days, and uh, I just wanted to know more about you. And that was in two thousand seven, eight. So, uh, so I mean, I think so. There's uh, thousands of uh, people like myself who have been inspired by your poetry. And um, so, having said that, in two thousand twelve, your collection "Black Cat Bone" won the T. S. Eliot Prize and Ford Prize. Can you say something about the book and how it changed your life? If it, <laughs> yeah. if it has ever. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, I guess we expect that um, winning a prize will change your life in some way. I mean, obviously it, it, it got more attention for the books. Um, I think there was a kind of feeling around then that I'd, I'd produced quite a lot of work, as it were, in terms of publishing. Mm -hmm. And I'd written 
but then I'd, I'd been writing novels and stuff as well. Um, and I remember there was one, the one piece that I actually quite enjoyed reading about the whole thing. I, I don't really like to read press and stuff, but there was one piece that said something like, John Burnside finally wins forward prize or something like that. And there's a sense of, oh, you know, I've been, I've been around for a while and, you know, maybe they've just been kind and give me the prize. Yeah. Wow. But I remember that we won the Pro World Prize, and uh, I say we because I, I really think of making a book as a collaborative thing with, the, you know, with the editor and the designers and people. And, and I really am proud of how our books have looked. You know, some of the nice covers, designs. I'm very much involved in that as well. But we had won the Forward Prize, and so the conventional wisdom was that if you win the Forward Prize, you don't win any other prizes. So we knew we were shortlisted for the for the um, T.S. Eliot Prize. I had a friend coming into town. She came and from the United States to visit. And my editor and I had lunch together that day. And um, we were kind of very relaxed, you know, and we were actually probably had a little too much to drink mm -hmm. after lunch. And we went back to his office, we were having coffee. And then suddenly somebody came in and said, uh, are you going to this award ceremony? He said, oh yeah, we'll go along. but." Um, and they said, well, you, it's really important that you do. I said, well, you know, we're not going to win anything because obviously that, but the, the person said, no, don't be sure of this, go go anyway. So I called my friend and we went over there together. And then I was really shocked when they announced that I won the, oh. the um, T.S. Eliot prize as well. So yeah. that was, I think at that time, there was one other person who won it. I think it was Sean, Sean O'Brien. Yeah. And uh, so it was nice because that made a bit of a kind of splash. Yeah. But, um. I, I usually tend to leave all of the kind of publicity side of things and the, the, the kind of that side of things to the people at the publishing house. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I just do what I'm, I'm kind of told to help sell the book. But my, what I'm really here to do is to read the po to write the poems. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm glad that that happened for the main reason is that some more people in normal, normal amount would know more about my work and maybe start engaging with it. Yeah, I, I really love the idea when you said we, because, uh, you know, it's, it's giving credit to all those hard work done by different people, you know, including the editors. And um, I remember yeah. uh, there was a there was a recent uh, uh, news about a Bollywood, you know, songwriter who was quite, you know, like uh, in the background, I think so, his name was Santos Anand or something, but somehow he came up, you know, he had, he had written wonderful songs, you know, uh, mm. Uh, but uh, his name was somewhat, you know, like not uh, too much popular. Uh, only the singers. So I mean, that that's I think one thing I think. Uh, and, uh, moving forward, like who was your role model, and when you started writing, and how has this changed over time? Uh, was there any particular, as you said, Marian Moore? Uh, you influenced by even poetry, but uh, other than that. Uh, authors that mm -hmm. yeah um well there were two particular sources of <laughs> of kind of not inspiration so much as a kind of model in a sense because i i didn't fit into the kind of english conventions at the time of convention of english british english poetry as it were so a lot of American poets had a big influence on me um, um, in the sense of giving me space to feel liberated, to, 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 to open out. Um, and also Spanish poetry. Um, when I was uh, first reading p poetry a lot, one of the things I did was I read a lot of Spanish poetry and um, especially poetry like uh, people like Antonio Machado, oh. um, Lorca, of course. Um, Guillén and these these uh, kind of silver age Spanish poets of the 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 nineteen twenties generation of poets um, who'd lived through the Civil War. Many of them were ended up being in, in exile in the United States or in in um, in South America, and also South American poets writing in Spanish. Um, and there was something about the cadences in that period of Spanish poetry which really kind of chimed for me. And I think that again. And also the, the, the one other thing I would say is that the Spanish poets gave me permission to write about the soul and the heart. Um, when I was starting to write poetry, it was very much a kind of, you know, kind of quite English sensibility, you know, um, you know, practical kind of 
Philip Larkin kind of feel to all, you know, there's a little bit of kind of, you know, every day and, and, and down to earth. And I was interested. I was interested in the heart. I was interested in the soul. So I was interested one day in how many times I'd read the word Alma in reading Spanish poetry and how many times at that time did one find the words the soul or talk about the soul in English poetry. So it's American and, and Spanish poetry in particular, a whole number of poets. And uh, more recently, um, the last several years, and now she's, um, I'm afraid, uh, died a few years ago, a couple of years back, I was very much engaged with the poetry of Lucy Brock Broido. Brock Broido. Um, she and I used to correspond. We never did actually meet in person, but we met like this on online and um, we corresponded. And I thought that she was, for me, she was my, my favorite contemporary poet. Um, certainly she's one of those poets who does things with language that is always surprising and, and renews the language. I think that's really important for us, that we are engaged with renewing the language you know, and 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 in England, I think um, I'm very much in, engaged with poets that, um, like my editor Robin Robertson, is a fantastic poet, and um, and uh, David Harsant is a wonderful poet, English poet that I very much admire, and I feel as though he's my he. It, we write very different kinds of poetry, but in many ways we've got similar interests, and I think he, I think of him, him as my true contemporary. It. Uh, we often hear that like poets, many of the poets, they create the environment or they need a particular mood to write. Do you have any type of, uh, uh, you know, like structured schedule or environment or a place or are you flexible while writing poetry? I have to be flexible. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I love the idea of, of you know, the, the study and the quietness and, the, you know, all that. I remember actually when I first started writing poetry, I, I had no idea what to do, how to do it. And I thought that one would sit down at a desk and get a clean sheet of paper and, you know, a nice pen and write poems. And I remember seeing the movie, um, Dr. Zhivago, and I saw it quite late. I'd, I'd read the book before I saw the movie, but I saw the movie and something about the image of Zhivago. And it was one scene where he's writing at a, a kind of kitchen table type table. And uh, he's, it's the middle of the night and the wolves are howling outside and the snow is falling, the little candle. And he's sitting there writing his poems. And I thought, that's how you do it, right? You sit like that. And I was, that's never worked for me. Um, for one thing, I don't write with a pen um, until I don't write anything down until quite far on in the process. Um, poet, poems tend to kind of build up in my mind. They kind of percolate. Um, you know, it's a little bit like, brewing something or maybe making compost you know this kind of <laughs> calculation process and eventually the words start coming i mean to begin with there's something else going on almost like a rhythm it's it's more it's, it's almost pre-verbal and then when the words come I, I let them stay in my head and then they um, start to take shape and i start writing down usually quite large chunks of of things before i actually start writing them down so you mean to say that like whatever the poetry it has to first brew inside and then in, in, in don't you i mean in my case like i often forget you know like if i don't remember I write down two or three lines when i remember uh, like sometimes yeah. they never come back has that ever happened to you like no <laughs> it's quite <laughs> odd <laughs> i used to write a lot of poetry when i was out walking because i used to walk a lot and um I used to stop and write things down and I felt like I was killing it. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to go for a walk. I'm not going to take pencil or paper or anything with me. And if I have something that I can bring back and I still remember it and it's, it's musical enough to remember, it's probably worth writing. And I started by doing that and I, and I would come back and I feel quite nervous, but um, I remember once I, I, I composed a poem while shopping on the market in Guildford on Saturday morning. And I used to, I love the market. And I would go to the market. I knew all the market people who were in the stalls and talk and discuss things like the flowers and the fruit and things like that that I was buying. And, and meanwhile, in between times, this was going on like, you know, in the back of your head, somewhere in the back of your head. And by the time I got back again to, the, um, to my house, I had about 12 lines and I wrote them down. And um, I remember feeling that, okay, I can rely on this method. This method works for me. 
And although I, I'm very forgetful about other things, when a poem starts building, I can quite re, it can be quite relaxed about it. I know I won't forget it. There's, there's a kind of sense, I almost feel as though if I did forget it, then it probably wasn't worth writing because it has to have that kind of musicality to be remembered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things that most of the uh, young poets or uh, poets, they, you know, whenever they write, uh, we often tend to be in a hurry to send it to the publisher, you know, like, how long mm -hmm. do you keep your poems before sending it out to the publisher? And what are the other process like editing? How much do you spend on that? I think this can be quite, uh, you know, like uh, insightful for thriving uh, mm -hmm. poets, you know? Yeah. Um, well, because of the way in which I work, a lot of the editing, if you like, I mean, it's, I wouldn't see it necessarily as being editing at that point, but a lot of the kind of refinement of the image, the idea, the, the, even the words, is done in my head before I write it down. But then what I tend, I always write down longhand. I don't, I'm not one of those people who can type things into a computer. I have to write it down, usually with a pen or a pencil, on a scrap of paper or a, a, a tatty book, whatever. And then I, um, I, I leave that for a while, just written down in some kind of rough form. Um, and then I, um, I mean, in terms of the words are there, the, the right words, usually mostly the right words, but the line um, breaks aren't necessarily right because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the rhythm and how to reproduce the rhythm in the line breaks. And then I type it up um, into a computer these days. I used to type it onto a typewriter, but, um, and then I start editing. And that's usually things like realizing that I, I remember reading that Otto Mandelstam, who was a, another poet who wrote, he called it writing on the lips. Mm -hmm. He was the person who wrote on the move on, while walking. He would often have a poem and he'd have a, an odd word in it, which was wrong, but it sounded like the word that he couldn't remember, you know, like, um, you know, he wanted to say one word, but he couldn't, it, it didn't come. And then something else came in its place. That's a kind of marker. It sounded quite like it, but it's completely semantically not, not appropriate, but it, it was a marker. So um, the little things like that, but then the, the, the thing I always have to really work on is how to lay a poem out on the page. Mm -hmm. I want the, the reader who reads the poem to hear it in their head, hopefully to speak it as well. And the way we lay things out on the page is, is, is almost like musical notation, mm -hmm. indicate to the reader Look, pause a little bit more here, or or you know, slow down here, or speed up here, or whatever. Just like we do in music by saying things like presto and pizzicato and that kind of stuff. And that's mostly done visually on the page, I think, for me. So that's probably the point at which I do most of my kind of thinking about the poem as a text, as a written text, as opposed to a soundscape, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, have oh, and you asked about how long to leave it. I then leave it for quite a long time before I send it to anyone. I I, I, I type it up in, in my finished form, and then I leave it for maybe you know several months, maybe in some cases. Okay, I mean for a single poem, you live several months, and you revisit that again. Yeah. You say that. Yeah, I'm, I mean sometimes people will want something, you know, like somebody will write to me and say we're doing this and it's it's for a good cause or something. And can you send us a poem and I'll probably take something that obviously un, un, unpublished and it's quite fresh, but I do feel uncomfortable if I send something out that's maybe more than, that's younger as it were than, than say three months or so. I like to leave it and then be sure that I'm, I'm as happy as I am, I'm, I'm as happy now as I was when I first finished editing it. Just read it again. And it's amazing that it's very small often, but sometimes if you come back to a poem, read it again, you say, Ah, that, why is that comma there? That we, I don't want that comma. That's wrong, or, or that word is wrong. Or usually it's things like punctuation or line spacing that, that you come back to. So you you want that strangeness between your <laughs> work and yourself to grow within those three months, so that you get surprised again. Yeah. With it. No, that's wonderful. That, tip, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful, and. Uh, have you traveled anywhere, particularly for writing pilgrimage, you know, like, let's say, oh, I'll go to this and this mountain, or, or I'll sit for a week. Uh, can you share one particular 
uh, such you know a journey with us. I've done a lot of pilgrimages in a sense um, to places that I've read about or that I associate with a certain poet that I love. Perhaps a nice little ordinary one in a sense was I um, I used to work um, in the computer industry and I, I worked in Spain. And um, I had the opportunity to go and visit um, Antonio Machado's, one of the places where Antonio Machado stayed. Um, and uh, I went there and um, I, I, I went to the town, the, the city, and um, I was staying in a nice hotel because my employer was paying. Um, and I said to the guy at the desk, oh, um, can you tell me how to go to the house, this house? Um, you know. He said, oh, you like uh, Machado? And I said, yeah, that's where he lived, yeah. And he said, yeah, but you know, it's a, kind of like a small museum now in a way, uh, but it's very simple um, and it's really close, you know, it's really close to the hotel. So I walked around to the place where he told me to go and um, I arrived at the place and uh, it was a small house and uh, there was a man there, a nice elderly man there. And I said to him, oh, this is the house where Machado lived um, when, he was on, when he was leaving the South on the way to France because he, you know, fled, he fled Spain because of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, yeah, he lived here, yeah, yeah. And I said, okay, um, um, can I see um, the house, look around the house? And he said, oh, I can show you his room. And I said, his room? And he said, oh, yeah, no, he didn't live in the house. He didn't live in the whole house. He lived in one room in the house. So we went into the house. And basically what it was was without a corridor, there were six rooms in a row. And we went into the first room. I said, oh, this is very nice. He said, no, this is not where Machado lived. And then we went to the next room. I said, oh, no, 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 no. And then eventually we went to the very last room, a small bare room mm -hmm. with a table a chair, a bed, a kind of little lantern type thing, um, and then a few shelves, and that was it. And a very small window, quite a small window, which looked out onto kind of part of a garden, but really mostly a wall. Yeah. And, you know, Machado's, Machado's poetry is full of seeing things through windows, like trees and, and flowers and gardens and things like that. Yeah. And, in fact, this is all imagination, certainly when he lived there. And he said, I said, this is where he lived. He said, yeah, he had to come through all the other people's house uh, rooms to get to this place. And this is where he stayed. And um, he used to just have a little kind of thing of soup and sit at the table. And he was very poor by then because of course, because of the being, being kind of fugitive really. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I looked at this table and chair and I really wanted to sit down where Machado had written some of his poems. And of course, it looked very, very old and rickety. And I thought some big guy like me sit on it and probably break. And the guy said to me, um, do you want to sit? And I said, oh, well, is that OK? He said, he said because you're a poet, you can sit there. Because we'd been talking. And I said, why? He said, why did you like Machado and, you know, a British person? And I said, well, you know, I write poetry. And so I, I was allowed to sit at Machado's chair and sat at the table you know, where he'd written. And I, that was a nice moment. I just felt somehow a connection. I think doing things like that connect us to traditions. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to, to remember the traditions. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to observe them sort of, you know, slavishly as it were, and just follow tradition, mm -hmm. but to remember tradition and, and, and to be nourished by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I really love the idea that when you shared uh, uh, the small room that you talked about, you know, where Masha mm -hmm. used to write. Uh, apart from writing, what uh, would you mind sharing some of your hobbies and interests, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, basketball. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't play basketball um, anymore, but um, I like watching basketball. So um, that's why I, um, that's just why I'm probably a little bit kind of uh, eccentric now because the last few months I've been staying up all night to watch basketball, but um, the NBA, but um, music and, and music in particular is um, important to me. Uh, I don't I don't play anymore. I used to play piano, but I have a quite bad arthritis and I don't play anymore. But my son is very musical, and so through him I learn a lot about new music. Mm. I have my music, you know, from my era and from classical and jazz. I'm particularly interested in jazz music. And then I listen to new music through my son, who's 16 now. And he says to me, oh, listen to this, listen to this. And I'm always learning new things from him, you know, listening to different kinds of music. And he plays guitars, keyboards, and stuff like that. So um, 
yeah, music's important. And of course, music and poetry are very close anyway. Um, you know, I, I don't think you could be into poetry so much as say I am as and not be not be interested in music as well. Mm-hmm. I'm also very interested. I used to do a lot more um, walking. I've traveled a lot to walk in mountains, uh, deserts, mm-hmm. tundras. You know, I like walking. I like solo walking and uh, just going out and just being alone for for days, you know, just walking. Yeah, I mean, that was what I was wanting to, you know, like share with you and get some feedback for our uh, viewers, you know. Uh, I find, uh, you know, camping, walking, or hill climbing, whatever, you know, like some form of association uh, with uh, creativity. You know, how do you mm. how do you find that connection with your writing? You know, as you said that you you're an avid walker, and uh, uh, yeah, could you share that? Please? Like, uh, how has that helped? Yeah. Um, I think one of the most important things, I think, for making anything, creating things, um, no matter what it is, is solitude. I think solitude is really um, an important part of being creative, or what the right term is. Um, to get away from the distractions of a social world, I'm not a very social person. In the sense, I like people, but I'm not really into being... You know, I don't like going to parties and things like that. Or I'm not socially skilled, as they say. Um, I like to be on my own, and and I like to uh, know that I can't be interrupted. So if you go out and you, you you know you leave a note at the hotel where you stayed, and that you're going to be away for the next three days walking in the desert or something, um, you're safe in the sense that you know that people know where you are if they get something bad happens. But you can be completely alone, and and nobody's going to come looking for you. And and I, I find that very enriching. And um, I particularly like walking in places where the land is flat, you know, and very open, and the sky is above you. And there's just that sense of space, that a huge sense of space. And I, I, I think of a poem like, I don't know if you know the poem by um, A.R. Armand's called Carson's Inlet. And he talks about the beginning of walking out of the city but everything is, you know, geometrical and regular and li- linear and angles and, you know, all of this kind of, kind of straight kind of lines. And then he walks out to the inlet and everything is natural there. And the all, that all disappears and there's a completely new geometry to the space. And I love the way he conveys that. And then there's a sense of um, a new kind of order that the human made order of the city gives way to the natural order where things seem more random and more more kind of, you know, loose. And, but in fact, there's a different kind of order out there. And I think it's one of the things that comes into our creativity is to move out from the established order that we live in and get out to some place where we experience a different kind of order, an order that might be quite challenging to begin with. Um, I like getting lost, for example. That's when you go on a, a long walk, as long as you don't do something too silly, I did once get lost. <laughs> I got lost in I got lost in the snow and the tundra in in, in in northern Norway. That wasn't so clever, but to go out and be a little bit lost, you know, is is often very invigorating for a kind of creative side, you know. Uh, so you you can find yourself, isn't it? If, I like the idea of getting lost, you know, like uh, as you said that everything. Uh, uh, within a form, within a certain geometric shape, that's that's not always uh, a creativity. Should be a, a, a sense of all random. You know, you don't know what to expect, and mm, mm. Um, and uh, somewhat uncharted. You know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's wonderful. You know? And uh, uh, what's a typical writing day for you? Or oh, like, uh, if you can share. With you. There isn't one now. I mean, to be honest, I, I was reflecting on this just recently because um, I. Oh, what's happening? Yeah, it's fine. It's okay. It's okay? Mm. I've got some strange screen on my. And then anyway, I'll keep on talking. <laughs> you can tell me. Yeah, yeah, wrong. it's okay. With you. <laughs> mm. um, I am um, a lot of what I. I've done in the past is I've gone on uh, residencies and, and lived in places where um, 
you know, I, I, it's structured in such a way that you can have long bouts of writing time. And um, that has been very, very good for me. I mean, especially when I'm writing a larger project, like putting a book or like one of my prose books. Mm -hmm. And recently I haven't done that, and obviously partly because of lockdown, etc., but also because of family things and, and very, for various reasons. And um, I work full time in, 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 at St. Andrews University, and I also um, do kind of journalistic type writing, etc. And um, my days these days are, are really kind of quite kind of movable feasts. I sometimes get a chance to, to go down. To, I have a garden studio, which I had built for me in the garden. And, I go down there to maybe do some work, but I never know how long I'll have because there's things going on, um, the family all being here and stuff. So I, I don't have that kind of regular writing, structured writing day that I used to have so much. Um, but it actually makes the writing time more precious though, in a way, you know, because it, you never know when you get a chance, but if you get a chance yeah. to do it, um, you, you know. But poetry I write, uh -huh. on the move anyway. I, I don't sit down to a table to write a poem. I work at a table to do things like prose projects and stuff like that. But poetry is something that's, that's I write it on the move. I don't, I don't sit down to do it. Okay. Uh, you know, this pandemic, it, it has crossed a, uh, a lot of people, you know, it's just, uh, uh, and a lot of uh, people uh, I've seen have resorted to poetry, you know, to somehow heal themselves. Do you think so? Poetry mm -hmm. can become very instrumental. I've seen a lot of uh, friends who have saved themselves by resorting to poetry in different ways. Even it has saved their lives, you know. Like, so uh, do you think so? Poetry can, after this post-pandemic, or you know, like the pandemic, as as as, as it, do you think so? Uh, a poetry can be crucial to elevate or to uh, heal, you know, like um, our soul or uh, our minds. Uh, what do you think? Mm. Mm. I think I think poetry. I mean, it's it's definitely the case that I think in certain extreme situations, poetry will help people. I mean, I remember reading about hostages uh, being take people who've been taken hostage, like uh, John McCarthy, for example, um, who'd been taken hostage and was kept for many years as a hostage. And one of the things he said was that one of the things that kept him going was he would recite poems to himself in his head, you know? And I, I, I certainly feel that there have been times in my life when I, I, I've i got by by just simply reading poems, um, special poems that are, matter a lot to me. But I think we shouldn't emphasize too much the, the use of poetry in extremists, as it were, um, that poetry is, is one of the, I mean, it doesn't have to be poetry, but poetry for me is the art form that reconnects me with the real world um, and then by the real world, I mean the world that is actually out there, isn't an illusion, isn't, isn't um, you know, just virtual or commercial or whatever you want to say. Um, poetry reminds us of the basic grace and elegance and order of the natural world around us. And it reminds us of the incredible beauty and elegance and power of language but also languages, um, pitfalls and dangers. And um, I, re I mean, I read poetry every day in my life. I mean, that is just, no matter what else happens, I find time to read a poem, one poem, two poems maybe in a day. And that's that, it's that sense of, that's a connective line for me to what I think of as the, as the real world behind what I think of as the kind of contrived world of, of a, a societal world, you know, I call it the authorized version of reality, the one that you see on the news and on the TV and you know that kind of the commercialized world um, that gets in the way sometimes of, of the natural world and, and of the wild that's out there and the wild that's in ourselves. And I think poetry reconnects us with that, can reconnect us with that. Yeah, I, I remember when you said that, I remembered you know, Ted Kuzer's, one of his poems to his mother, uh, I think, uh, which has ended like, had you not, it's something like, had you not taught me to appreciate the beauty of small things, you know, like I would have been lonely forever. So it's somehow, yeah. you know, like to appreciate the, you know, just uh, 
small things of life. Maybe that also helps during the during this, uh, you know, like uh, during this pandemic. Let's say, you know, like for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I think I think we have got. Uh, I would just like to say to the viewers that uh, this program is sponsored by the Scottish Book Trust, and uh, we've got uh, maybe after uh, we'll hear some of uh, Joan's uh, poems let on, and uh, maybe ten minutes left for. Uh, the viewers to ask questions as well. So, uh, in the end, just to uh, let you all know, uh, uh, people say that uh, creatives or poets, you know, they have a strong attachment with either the dusk or the dawn. You know, the setting sun or the rising sun. And uh, yeah, I myself, when I whenever I see, you know, I, especially I, I'm very much obsessed with the setting sun. I just have to go and, you know, go to the countryside. See, uh, do you have any type of thing like? Do, would you like to every day when you wake up? Would you like to, to see the sunrise or, or sunset? Is there any? Do you have any uh, fondness for that? Mm. I I do find that the both the beginning of the day and the end of the day, or rather, the let me think of this beginning of something, the end of something, the transitional parts of the day when 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 we're moving from one state to another. I think that's very important um, for the spirit. Um, I think uh, from my kind of background, if you like, um, my, my blood heritage, as it were, is basically Celtic and pagan. And um, those people valued um, transitional points, crossing lines um, thin paths and um, time, certain times of day. Um, there's that transitional time between you know, the day through the dusk into the night where magic can happen. And I, 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 I very much value those. I often find that I, I write more at around about 5 a.m., that wow. kind of time, in the summertime anyway. Um, and I often will we'll go down to the studio about that time and um, um, just sit. I don't do anything, I just sit. But um, those times are very rewarding. I like, I mean, some some critics have mentioned the fact that I, I often use words like almost or, uh, you know, things to do with something almost being there or nearly there. or And I like that. I like the proximate. Um, I think I, I often feel when I hear someone say something that, yeah, that's true, but it's too, it's too hard and fast. It's, it's more fluid than that. It's not quite so, you know, linear and hard and fast. So I think those times of day kind of loosen up that part of our minds and our souls that um, that are kind of constrained by the kind of hard and fast way of to approach things in society. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, for the, uh, is it possible to listen to some of your poems today? I mean, sure. yeah, I mean, yeah, um, we'll, we'll have a, maybe, uh, We've got uh, uh, roughly 15 minutes left, so maybe we can leave, uh, you know, like the last uh, seven to eight minutes for questions. So maybe we'll see a few poems, you know. Yeah, sure. I'll change glasses so I can see what I'm doing. So uh, the poem I want to read is, uh, is actually from, um, this is the part where I do what I'm told by the publishers and I wave my book around. <laughs> this, is, this is the new book, which is coming out in August. It's called Learning to Sleep. And it's got this beautiful green cover. I, I'm very pleased with the cover. And on the cover is a picture of uh, the uh, god Hypnos, who is the god of sleep. And one of the themes of the book is, is, is um, I have a severe, well, it's not one sleep disorder, I have a combination of sleep disorders. So I've had very bad sleep history 
in my life. And then the part of the poetry in here is about the problems that come of, um, you know, being so so disconnected. But um, last year I, I had a near death experience um, when my heart stopped and um, they took me to the hospital and uh, they thought I had COVID because I wasn't breathing and various things happened. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, that was probably the, the reason I, I got ill that way was because of a long history of, you know, the strain on my heart from not being able to sleep. Um, and per, kind of looking at facing personal um, possible extinction uh, makes made me think a lot about extinction generally as well. But this poem is, is, is about that kind of question of the community of life, the sense of being all one breath and, um, and uh, the sense of, you know, it all being at risk from the fear of extinction. So it's called Notes Towards an Extinction. Late in the day, and behind us, the former high road. Stray dogs hunting in the back streets, where we once played catch kiss and blind man's buff all summers long. New Latin, like a wasp nest on our tongues. Plant names and packs for biscum. Roman God. Odds tender, but more mostly we were schooled in absence at our best in lamp bearing on our tongues from church to home, mere lamplight in the house, and nothing animate, no starlings in the roof, no field mice in the cupboard under stairs. So now there is no end to what we know. Though what we know is never quite enough to set things right. The catechismal rot between the leaves of Moonfleet or the London Almanac. The short shrift of a casual fathering. And still no easy way to say goodbye. Story as last resort. Repentance as fabric. That linger like a footfall in the rock of ages where we lift our eyes to see the megafauna, bright as cherubim, gone down into the flood and still not drowned. And that, the, the, I, I guess the idea of the sequence that poem comes from is to try and suggest um, you know, that sense of the, the magic of life, any kind of life, living things, and, and the, the sheer awfulness of the thought of losing mm. any any form of life from you know mm. from from human life to uh, 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 you know uh, I remember um, I met somebody who was a, 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 a um, zoologist who was traveling in South America and had discovered um, a very rare um, frog a kind of tree frog mm -hmm. and uh, they found this one frog but they didn't know if there were any others it might be the last of its kind, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting what happens when you when you do this, when you identify an, a, an animal which may or may not be a sub subject to possible extinction. You have to wait a long time to establish the extinction of something before you can scientifically declare it's extinct. So mm -hmm. often uh, the last sighting of an animal might be 1940s, mm -hmm. and that will be declared extinct in the 1970s or 80s. You have to wait so long. So there's that horrible feeling of, of during that time, what was it like? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what was it like? What, what happened to the last of those species, you know? And I think of the, the, the megafauna who, who died out in the Ice Age, or even things like the extinction of language. I, I once wrote a poem about um, the loss of the language, Ubich, mm -hmm. which was a Caucasian language, which, um, there was a really moving story I read about a, a guy called Oli Stig Anderson, who was um, trying to go to visit a man who was the last speaker of this language, Tefvik Essent, um, who was the um, last speaker of Ubik. And he arrived in the afternoon to visit the man, and the man had died in the morning. Mm -hmm. So that you think, that's, you know, who hears that language anymore? The beauty of that language, the, the word for rose or dog or, or piano or whatever in that language, you know? 
Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, can we have one more poem? You know, then we can. Sure. Maybe one of the one of her best ones. <laughs> one of her <laughs> best ones. <laughs> and then we can um, we can ask go to the questions uh, if there's any from the audience. So. Yeah. Um, so the other, another theme of the book is is um, the institutionalization of our of our lives and. Um, one of the uh, you know different kinds of institutionalization, like church, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to gospel, or um, you know marriage contracts as opposed to love, and uh, the way in which society institutionalizes things that are you know our most dearest uh, things like love and, and spirituality, they make them into orthodoxies and, and, and institutions. Mm -hmm. So this is a poem um, about that idea of the the in this case from a man's point of view so it's the spouse as it were or the partner who is the one that you discover after you meet the the real person the one who becomes the wife or the husband you know it's called affiance by oath rain at the gates and here she is again regatta of the northlands part acetylene part mother she will teach him how to love not wisely, but too well. And why he can't be kind is just a map he never learned to read. Though he could tell one landmark from another, killing floor from chapel in the woods, the low road vanishing at times into the mire that waits to be resumed, the way the heart resumes its darkest form and hunkers down to feed on any sweet meat it can find. An anti love poem, I suppose you'd say. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, maybe uh, we'll open uh, questions for the audience. If there's any, please, uh, maybe I'll, you can unmute yourself, or if there's any question, you can write in the chat box or unmute as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I have a question for John. Okay, hey, John. Let me. Uh, Hi. Let me show the. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for your uh, uh, wonderful I, poem. Hi, Gopis. Can you yeah, see uh, in a video? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, he says yeah, I, I have yeah. video because the host has disabled it. Okay. So I, 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 think, I think you would have to yeah, uh, enable okay. my uh, yeah. video. Okay. All right. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, John. Yeah, again. Thank you Hi. for a wonderful poem. Uh, I've got a general qu uh, question for you. I think uh, you might have uh, you already spoken about it because because uh, yeah, I joined the call late. So, what's a poetry for you, John? So, right. so my question to you is, uh, what is a poetry for you? Why well, is poetry? That's a big yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, one of the things I'd say the most important thing for me about defining something as poetry is the musicality of the of the language. Um, I mean, obviously, prose can have music, but it tends to be quite a looser music. And um, I think there's a combination between um, image and music that's unique to poetry. So although I've, I've written prose poetry, for example, in the past, um, there's a quality of musicality which is uh, necessary to, to say something's a poem. And I actually, I find it sometimes quite odd. I've read poetry quite a lot recently, actually. And then, and um, it, I thought, oh, um, but, but this is kind of prosy. This is kind of flat. There's not enough music in it for me. So I think that's the one thing that's, that separates it out um, is that sense of musicality. But I also think there's something else which can go on in poetry. It doesn't have to, but it's what the kind of poetry I like most. And it's um, a different way of looking at the world, a different way of thinking, if you like. Um, there's a Spanish poet philosopher whom I very much like, and I spoke about her in a book I wrote two years ago. Uh, her name is Maria Zambrano, and she wrote an incredible, um, quite dense essay called uh, Philosophy and Poetry. Um, and she talks about this 
what she called la razón poética, poetic reasoning, poetic thinking. And it's interesting to see that through the 20th century, many philosophers said, philosophy can only take you so far. Beyond that, you have to find some other way of thinking about the world. And Heidegger and Wittgenstein and many others said, the, that way is poetry, that kind of poetic sensibility. So I think for me, poetry can, does not have to have, but it can for that kind of new way of thinking about the world. Yeah. Thanks, uh, John. Has that answered your question, Gopis? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, so when you say uh, musicality, so I, 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 I referring to a rhythm or, or something around the lines, John? Yeah, rhythm and all, all of the things that happen in, in, in language that make something musical. I think we have to be cautious about what I found that I objected to when I was growing up was I would be taught that this is a poem and it would be like a sonnet, say, or a villanelle, or whatever. And it would be a, a European form, received form that came from a, a European tradition. And I remember I was talking to Joy Harjo, the American uh, native poet, um, she's a Muscogee poet. And she was saying, look, you, you know, um, Europeans and Americans have, um, you know, why Americans have their traditions and their classical forms, but so do we, the Muscogee people have our classical forms. And it's, it's really important to recognize music from different cultures and different um, you know, geographies. Um, and sometimes it takes uh, a lot of learning from some, for, say for someone from the English, British English tradition to even learn, to understand, to, to see the musicality of certain kinds of American poetry or Spanish poetry or um, Aboriginal poetry or song from from uh, Australia or um, poetry from Asia and poetry from the Sami area and north of Norway, for example. These are all poetries that are musical in the context of a tradition that they're working in, and but you can hear it. You don't have to understand it still to hear it. You can still hear that music. And that's the, what invites you in to try and understand more about how that, that is made, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, we, we, I think so. We have got uh, time for one more question, if there's any audience. Uh, um, may I? Uh, yeah, yes, please. Uh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, John, I would like to introduce uh, Noras Parazuli is a very popular and famous poet in Nepal. And he's traveled around Hi. taking his poetry, so it'd be wonderful. Uh, please. Uh, um, hi, John. Hi there. Um, uh, first of all, before I ask you a question, um, today I felt really, really warm to know that somebody, because I read your poems, and, and be, be, but I didn't know your opinion about poetry. But um, today, after hearing you, I feel like um, the other person thinks almost exactly the same way I do, um, because uh, because um, mainly, as you said, for me to when I write poem, the poem is already ready in my head before I type a word. It's already mm -hmm. there. Actually, I can perform it without looking at the page. The poem is already ready in my head before I type it. So. Um, it's it's great to know that uh, somebody else does that too, and yeah. also the musicality of it. That's something I got really fascinated by, the musicality. You know that that's something primary thing I feel that differentiate it from poetry. Now my question is, and and actually one more thing. I'm so sorry for taking this long. Um, I really loved when you said we uh, when you got the prize. You know that that culture is so so much to learn from you. You know that was so new for me, and and that's something that I haven't seen people practicing around here, calling it like we. You know, like um, I got one of the national award, but I said I then, so I'm feeling guilty for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've learned to say we now. If I ever got yeah. another, and now my question is, my question is pretty boring actually, because everybody asks that question, and 
even when I go to, when I'm called for interviews, they ask me the same question, but still I would like to ask you that question. Um, the question is similar to what is poetry, but that's, it's not that. My question is, when you're writing it, or even before when you, something, is, something is cooking in your head, for example, mm -hmm. how do you know that that's, that something that's in your head is, is poetry? You know, that could be a poetic essay or, 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 or any other genre of, of literature. You know, mm. how do you know that this is something that I'm about to create is poetry, you know? Like, how do you know that besides later when we write, you know, yeah. the separating the lines and all that, you know, because I write in different forms. I write essays, um, drama, I've write, written screenplay for cinema. But like, what is your personal process of knowing it that, okay, this something that I'm about to create is poetry. How, how do you know that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 the question. Yes, and, and isn't it? It's an old question. It's an interesting one, though. It's, it's I mean, usually the old questions are actually because they're, they're old questions because they're very interesting, and there's never a fixed answer for them. But for me, mm -hmm. um, it has to do. It has to do with something that actually, as I said before, is kind of like almost pre-verbal, something that precedes the actual arrival of the words. It's mm. like a kind of rhythm, if you'd like, or, or mm. something like that, um, mm. that, that, that kind of imbues the words when they come with mm. their form. Um, obviously, in some cases, there's a, a kind of quite quickly something quite formal emerges and mm. you recognize that that's where it's going. But yeah, as, as you say, there are times, I mean, I have written poems. When I, I think my second book had some prose poetry in it. And mm -hmm. I, I had only read French and Spanish prose poetry. I didn't read any English poet, prose poetry that I liked particularly, maybe mm -hmm. Jeffrey Hill's um, 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 Mercy and Hymns. But um, I, I still recognize this as, as poetry because of some kind of rhythmic quality to it, which is there mm -hmm. right from the start. Mm -hmm. and, you mm -hmm. know, it's almost like, you know, the first few cells of a new wife <laughs> to emerge and you see something yeah. and you think, oh, this is going to be a duck or going to be a human being or a tree okay. or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. But you're not quite sure why you understand that. Um, mm. I, I hope that some of the, the prose I write, for example, has got musicality to it, kind of rhythmic mm -hmm. uh, feel to it and, 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 and chiming and echoing and things. But there's something about that which isn't the same as, as what emerges as a poem. There's something in the poem that's organically different. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't put my finger on exactly how to describe that, but I, mm -hmm. I just feel it. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, again, I, one of the things that I was talking about with um, the idea of uh, La Razón Poetica from Maria Zambrano is the, the emphasis on understanding that thinking or knowing isn't higher in some way than feeling and intuiting and, and guessing. Mm -hmm. These are all mm -hmm. human faculties. And I think she and people like Rachel Carson, uh, we should thank them. A lot of women working in the middle of the 20th century begin to understand that we have, we have wonderful uh, abilities in terms of deductive reasoning and logic and those things, but they only go some of the way to, towards navigating the world around us. And they start to say, look, let's remember that feeling, you know, is important <laughs> to how we feel, what we intuit. Um, and I think that's something that I think are certainly uh, my world, my culture, mm. my society needs to learn where, mm. you know, you could do terrible things because it makes sense logically, but that you mm. feel it's wrong, you know, and why, yeah. why isn't the feeling allowed to take part in this d decision process? Totally. You know? So I, I think it's just that kind of, it, it, one uses one's intuition in a sense mm -hmm. to recognize. It doesn't really matter in a way because all, Robert Frost said something I think is very, very um, important to remember. Um, mm -hmm. The poet's job is not to get in the way of the poem. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, one of the things we can do is try and shape the poem. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Just try to do it too early trying to shape it to what we think a poem should be. And, and it's important to just let the poem come in its own organic mm -hmm. form. 
Mm. Well, that makes some That's sense. Beautiful. So, yeah. Beautiful. It does. It does. It does make sense. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Norazwe. And uh, okay. uh, to end with, uh, uh, John, it was nice talking to you. And uh, uh, there was a touch of uh, strangeness and spir spirituality. And, uh, you know, like uh, quite a heightened sense of awareness, you know, like. And uh, I think uh, this is, this will go through. Um, uh, the audience in Mr. Mountain as well. Do you have anything to say to uh, Mr. Mountain, you know, and uh, the Scottish Book Trust? Any, any uh, short messages, you know? The message, you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any, any message to well, Mr. Mountain? And uh, well, um, uh, until until you got in touch with me about uh, doing this talk, I, I wasn't aware because I, I, I've, I've been ill the last while and various things. So I wasn't aware what you were doing. This is fantastic what you're doing. So I'm glad that the, the Book Trust is supporting you. I mean, that's really very, very important. <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that um, I think the pandemic has allowed us to see is that there are ways of communicating that we have had available to us like you know, like doing this, for example, and nothing beats being in the same room and having a kind of convivial conversation. But we can use these kind of ways of communicating, talk about poetry, and um, share, you know, and worldwide from around the world, we can share our ideas, and I think that's really important. Yes, thanks, John, and it was wonderful talking to you. Thanks to all the audience, uh, uh, and the, the, this video will record in our uh, Mission Mountain website as well. And uh, thanks to Scottish Book Trust for sponsoring this program. Uh, uh, lastly, I would like to end this uh, uh, program with uh, your saying, Ajun. Our response to the world is essentially one of wonder, of confronting the mysterious with a sense not of being small or insignificant, but being part of a rich and complex narrative. John Burnside from strong words. So thank you very much, John. And uh, maybe I can, if you can you. Unmute, um, unmute yourself and give John a big clap. So, and that's what. Uh... Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, John, yeah. for uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, answering our questions. And nice to uh, meet you. And uh, thank you, Navin, sir, for uh, yeah. inviting me to the call. All right. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you, Take care. See Have you. a good day. Yeah. Bye. Uh, see you. See you some another time. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye, John. Take care. Bye. Bye.